This tree here, sometimes known in English as a banyan fig, Latin name is Ficus prolixa. The scientific name is Ficus prolixa. Here on Pompeii, the tree is known as Ayao, Ankoshai, Konya. There's a name in Trukis that I know I cannot pronounce, but Ao is the Trukis name. On Koshai, this tree is said to hold the land together, to hold the mountains together. That if this tree is to is cut, you'll lose the mountains. And indeed, its roots do knit together large areas of soil. And it is found in Koshai up on top of hilltops. Here on Pompeii, the Ayao tree is said to be a home for any, a home for spirits. This tree was planted in 2000 by then Governor Del Pangolinan. It's the Millennium Tree, located here in the Pompeii Botanic Garden. It's characterized by the aerial roots that drop down from above and gradually when they reach ground, set into the ground. And so these trees are characterized by having multiple trunks on them. Down in Vanuatu, they're considered actually a good place to put a kava market for selling kava by one of these trees. But here on Pompeii, people are more circumspect around it. The leaves are said to be able to be used in uh, with oil to help uh, produce some longer, more luxuriant hair. On this ayao, you can also see a number of seedless vascular plants, uh, a nephrolepis fern here, the Phymatosaurus scolopendria there, and uh, also on this tree, you'll uh, see other, other plants growing, other epiphytic plants, plants growing on top of other plants. This tree here is Syzygium aromaticum. It's a clove tree. In this section of the course, we'll be looking at gymnosperms, timber trees, and spice plants. These are the leaves of the clove tree. This tree has had cloves on it, to the best of my knowledge, only twice since 2004. There is something about our climate that does not favor the production of cloves by this clove tree or any of the other clove trees here in the garden. So, this is a clove tree, but it doesn't often produce cloves. But the leaves, when you crush them, have a very distinctive clove-like smell. This unit also focuses on gymnosperms. The gymnosperms are plants that produce cones, but no flowers and no fruit. The classic gymnosperm is the pine. In this case, Araucaria columnaris, also known as a Cook Island pine tree. The Cook Island pine. These trees produce cones. There's no flowers, there's no fruit. You have, if you've seen this tree, you've seen the cones, but probably not known it. If you take a good look here, these are the microfill-like leaves of Araucaria columnaris. Those are the leaves. But here on the ground, if one looks carefully underneath these trees, some of these things are dried leaves. Uh, this one there is a dried leaf. But this here, uh, this, sorry, this is a cone. That's a male cone. This is a male cone. They grow in bunches higher up on the tree and they fall off. If you look closely at this, it's different than the ones that leave. So, um, this has leaves. That's a dried branch with leaves. This here is a male cone. There's another male cone. The male cones produce pollen. Pollen is different than the spores produced by the ferns. And so these trees produce pollen.
These are, as far as I know, the oldest ones we have here on Pompeii. They go back into the 1950s or 1960s. U.S. Department of Agriculture during Trust Territory time put these trees here. One thing to note is you don't see babies. They do actually produce female cones. The female cones are round and found near the top of these trees. Uh, but we don't often see them unless somebody cuts a tree down. We don't see them down near ground level. And so we're usually without them at ground level. But they do produce a female cone high in the tree, uh, high up at the top. Uh, and on the ground we'll see just the uh, the male, generally the male cones on the ground. They don't produce babies for reasons that escape me. Again, I don't know why, but I've never seen a tree produced that way. We reproduce this particular tree by cutting off the top and planting the top. A moment ago we looked at a clove tree. That's a spice tree, followed by looking at a pine tree. Uh, which is brought in for timber. This is another in the spice family. This is a cinnamomum verum tree, known more commonly as a cinnamon tree. If you scratch the bark and smell it, you can smell the distinctive aroma of cinnamon. The cinnamon comes from an inner layer of bark inside the tree. These are the leaves here of the cinnamon tree. The leaves, when they first come out, have a very characteristic reddish, greenish, pinkish look to them, as seen here. And the cinnamon itself is in an inner bark layer underneath, in here. And uh, we don't have smell of vision available in this class, but if you could smell it, it smells like cinnamon. This palm like looking tree is no palm. This is a tree known as a cycad. This is Cycus, possibly Circinalis, we're not certain. But one of the key gives away that you're not looking at a palm is, well, have you ever seen a palm tree with branches? But the other thing that's a giveaway, and it's not visible at this time of year, is that this tree produces cones. The cones form at the very top of the tree at the very apex of each trunk, a cone will form uh, during a, the right time of the year for that particular tree. So this is actually, believe it or not, a pine tree. The branches look like a palm tree branch, but they're actually much thicker. They're not thin, and they're, they last much longer. These branches will stay here for years. They're a very slow-growing tree. This particular tree is uh, from the Japanese era, from the 1930s. And yet, you can see it's not that tall. It's no more than about uh, 30 or 40 feet tall. And so, uh, it's, uh, it's been here a long time, but it hasn't grown very quickly. You'll see if you come this way, these rings form at about one a year. It forms one crown of leaves per year. So it takes quite a while before you have a new set of leaves. The leaves will last many years before being replaced. So this is a gymnosperm. It produces cones, no flowers, no fruit, and it produces pollen as well. It has this corrugated, rugged trunk. It is said that if you can find one of these small outgrowths on a trunk, uh, they form higher up on this particular tree, those can be used to propagate them. I've had very little success myself, but there's some up there, way up there, there's some new ones right in the middle of the screen there. And those, if broken off, are said to be able to propagate it. They're called pups, but I've never successfully propagated these uh, particular uh, gymnosperms. Here we can see a cycad cone on a different species of cycad. 
though not technically a spice plant, this here is a coffee cherry, the green berries there. When they're ripe, they'll turn a deep, bright red. These are not ripe yet. We're not yet in the coffee berry season, the coffee cherry season. But these are coffee berries, cherries, called coffee cherries. And the coffee bean is actually inside uh, these. So I've opened up one of these, and inside is a bean. It's not yet roasted, so it's not brown, but that's a coffee bean from the inside of a coffee cherry on this coffee plant. This is black pepper growing untended and wild here. It has a leaf that's it's not chordate. Uh, it's uh, heart-shaped as some other members of the pepper family are. But it does have this characteristic segmented sort of stem to it. And so that's black pepper, an important spice plant. This is Maristica fragrance, the nutmeg tree. That's the nutmeg fruit. This fruit actually contains two different spices in it. It contains nutmeg and the spice mace inside the center of the fruit. The fruit itself is not used. These trees don't grow very large. They're a fairly short tree. This tree is quite old, probably decades old, still producing very heavily. Uh, many nutmegs still growing on the tree, but not that tall and not that large. Now, nutmeg was very, very valuable. It was nutmeg that was found only in the Moluccan Islands of Indonesia. They drew foreigners to travel across the oceans seeking nutmeg. In fact, Columbus was not trying to get to America. He was trying to find a way to get to the Moluccan Islands when he sailed to the west from Spain to get to America. Well, nutmeg is very valuable. Inside the nutmeg fruit, the red part is called mace. This is a strange structure that's actually on the outside of the nutmeg nut. This, come, this mace layer comes off. It's called an aril, A-R-I-L, aril. This is what mace is made from. The mace oil concentrated produces the chemical agent mace. And the nut inside here, that's the inside this hard shell, is nutmeg. The nutmeg itself is inside this shell. Inside the nutmeg nut is the nutmeg itself, seen here in the center of this uh, image here. The two in the middle are an, an older uh, nutmeg nut, not one that would be used in commercial production, but a nutmeg nut. And nutmeg is the valuable part of nutmeg, the part that foreigners sailed the seas to obtain from the Moluccan Islands in Indonesia. Eucalyptus deglupta was brought in as a timber tree. It's the Mindanao gum tree, as it's sometimes known, or more commonly the rainbow gum, because of the varied multi-cued bark that the tree is characterized by. But it was actually brought in not for its good looks, but because it produces a very long, straight trunk that goes up and up and is straight all the way up. You can get 16, 32, even 64 foot long boards from this tree. Boards that you need to make uh, beams for ceilings and other long spans. So the value of this particular tree was as a timber tree. It was brought in as for timber, just as the Aracaria columnaris was brought in as timber. Today these trees are left in place usually because of their beautiful bark. But they were originally brought in for as a timber tree. This is pine rosin, 
seeping out from the side of this pine tree. But this pine tree doesn't have needles. This pine tree has leaves. This is Agathis lanceolata, also known as a cowrie pine. It has thick strap-like leaves rather than needles. It's a gymnosperm. It produces cones. These trees are perhaps 50, 60, maybe 70 years old. Higher up, we can see more rosin coming out from the tree. These are still young trees though. They got this lanceolata tree will live for over 200 years as far as anybody knows. So these trees have not yet produced cones, but they are a gymnosperm like the Cook Island pine we met earlier. There are three here on Pompeii, and only three. The only other cowrie pine I know of is one out in the forest at the old Mott School in Koshrai in Walung. And you have to go up the old coral stairs in the forest to even find that tree. It's hidden in the forest. I don't think anybody realizes it's there. So there's four of these trees I've seen in Micronesia, and three of them are here. Uh, in the botanic garden on Pompeii, and the other one is in Koshrai. I have not seen cones from this tree, but then in the world of Agathis trees, these are still technically young and may not be old enough to produce cones, or it may be that on this particular species the cones stay attached to the tree. But this is a, a kauri pine tree. Just behind them, are another timber tree that we looked at earlier, the Araucaria columnaris, and as we saw before, the male cones here on the ground. To my left are more timber trees, including mahogany trees. In the distance, mahogany is another timber tree at Ponlangas here on Pompeii. There are many mahogany trees. And then there are these strange trees here with the white bark. These are pimenta dioica. These are all spice trees from the Caribbean. These are a spice tree. In with this timber collection here. So we have the agathis pines over there. And over here we've got the allspice. Now allspice comes from a floral structure, but even these, even the leaves of this particular tree have a distinctive, strong smell of allspice. So there's, these are quite old. They're not very large, but they are quite old. And they are allspice trees. The next row of trees in this collection of timber and spice trees are Agathis lanceolata timber trees with the rainbow colored bark. Agathis lanceolata here with the colorfully striped bark. There is a teak tree. It's a bit hard to see the teak tree because in amongst the teak tree is also a, a strangler fig growing on it. There's another one of our uh, uh, the eucalyptus deglupta timber trees. And in that back corner, way back there, that tree there, that's Calophyllum inophyllum. That's a tree that's unusual in that it will grow on the high islands and here on the, and on the atolls. It's a tree known on Pompeii as Iso and Kosha is Ita, and Chuk is Rakich. And on Ulithi, one Ulithian said it's called Safang, but it's a, it's a tree that uh, grows both on the high islands and the low islands back there. It has a white flower with a yellow center to it. So this part of the garden is really a collection of timber trees 
including the Eucalyptus deglupta, one spice tree, the allspice trees, and the pine trees, which are again brought in as timber to explore the possibility of growing them as timber. You can see by looking at a tree such as this one here, they have a long straight trunk, ideal for producing long straight boards. And so these were brought in for timber. So that's a look at timber plants, spice trees, and the millennium tree, Ficus prolixa, trees that happen to be in the botanic garden here in Pompeii. The spice trees and the timber trees are economically valuable trees. Ethnobotany has roots in economic botany, the study of plants that were economically valuable, and those connections remain between the two fields of economic botany and ethnobotany. So timber trees, spice trees, are ethnobotanically important trees, and they are economically important trees.